Hi, and welcome to the 10th weekly meeting of Sketchbook Club. And because it's the 10th, seems sort of significant, I thought of maybe, I don't know, having a medal struck or uh, having some kind of gala event somewhere to commemorate the enormous history of this club and all the incredible things that we've accomplished here together. But instead I thought I would do something even more momentous and I would tell you about a set of books that I know probably better than anybody and probably better than just about any other book I own. And those are the books that I personally have written. And I want to tell you a little bit about what each book is about, but also to tell you the stories behind them. And these are things that I haven't really ever particularly talked about. How did these books come to be and what was the point of them? And um, so I want to start with a book that I know you have not read. And it's the very first book that I ever wrote. And it is called The Guide to the Bars of New York. Kind of different from sketchbooks, it's true. But another one of my passions, going to bars, having a beer. And um, I wrote this book when I was 23. And I was fortunate enough to get a book contract from what was then a pretty significant publisher called Prentice Hall. And I got a book contract to write this book before I'd even written it. I wrote a proposal and I somehow blundered my way into having a book contract at 23, which is pretty cool. And I spent um, the next, I don't know how long it took me, at least six months, going to different bars and writing essays about them. So, and I tried to have sort of a different point of view than had ever existed before. And the, and the way that I came to write this book was that I was supposed to meet somebody in Midtown, Manhattan, and um, they said, well, let's go to a bar. And I, it, was a, it was a neighborhood, part of, of Midtown that I wasn't really familiar with, and I didn't know any bars there. And so I didn't know what one does. Like, I mean, this was before Yelp and Google and a lot of the resources that we have now to find out what is a decent bar. Um, and so, you know, you could look something up in the phone book, maybe the yellow pages, but that was not a great way to find a bar. And in any case, it wasn't broken down by neighborhood, so it was kind of useless that way. And so later I went to a bookstore and I thought, well, there are restaurant guides. I should get a bar guide so I know, you know where to go. And it turned out there wasn't such a thing. Nobody had written a guide to the bars of New York. Um, that would just sort of tell you what it was like there. And at the time I'd read, a, there, was, there were a couple of, of restaurant reviewers that I really liked who wrote reviews not just of sort of like, you know, descriptions of the dishes and, you know, um, what the value was for your dollar, but really were more um, essays that were almost like new journalism, that were an opportunity to kind of experience what it would be like to go to this bar, so to this restaurant. So I thought I would try and do the equivalent for bars, and it was just an opportunity to write a bunch of stuff. So here is the manuscript of the guy. As you can see, it's quite a, quite a weighty, thick thing. Um, I've, here it is, the dedication to the most inspiring, exciting, and vexing mistress of them all to New York. Yes, and then, um, this will read you a little bit of the introduction, just why not? It's been gathering dust for how long has it been? Over 30 years. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's still relevant. I wrote here, think about it, you leave your home or office and travel some distance to sit in a room full of strangers. And then you pay someone $3 to pick up a $10 bottle of liquor and pour a fraction of it into a glass for you. Sitting on a hard stool, you toy with some pretzels and listen to music you didn't select. Occasionally, you talk to someone next to you about how well certain grown men play a game you gave up at 12. In a way, that's all a visit to a bar is about, but there's much more than boozing to having a good time at a bar. This book is about those other things we visit bars for and the places you can and can't find them. One of the most important factors is neutrality 
It's easier and cheaper to have a drink in your home or office, but it's less personal and territorial to meet a business associate, friend, or lover in a bar. By meeting in a bar, you're saying, we're equals here. We can talk freely. Of course, this neutrality is made a bit shaky if you happen to be a regular at the bar you meet in, but that's a subtlety that can easily work to your advantage. A second factor is that bars can be comfortable and convenient. Some are even beautiful. They let you relax and enjoy drinks you might need a machete and a glacier to make yourself. They let you tie one on with some friends and not end up with empties jammed behind your TV. Anyway, it goes on in that vein for several hundred pages afterwards. Um, yeah, so, so many great um, bars in New York and a lot of them, actually I bet you the majority of the ones in this book don't even exist anymore. Um, but then here at the end I had this list, an alphabetical list of the bars and this breaks it down to whether it's a good people watching bar, whether it's preppy, whether it's peaceful, um, whether it's for young people, and it just goes on and on like that through, through this guide. And then, and then it breaks them down to romantic bars, <coughs> expensive bars, cheap bars, beautiful bars, peaceful bars, and so forth. I don't know. I haven't really looked at this book in a long time, to be honest with you, but it's, it's actually not bad. I mean, considering that I was a mere stripling when I wrote it at 23. So what happened? Why, is this book, why does this book exist only in this binder? Because it does. Well, not long after I'd finished writing it and submitted it um, to my editor, I discovered that he had been fired. I don't think it had anything to do with necessarily with giving me a contract, but maybe that hadn't helped. Anyway, he was fired. He was replaced by another person who said, interesting, um, I think you need to just completely throw out everything you've written and start again. And this time, you know, I need you to have just like lists of all the drinks that are on offer, a list of all the bar foods, prices, etc., etc." So exactly the kind of thing that I didn't want to write, exactly the kind of thing that I had never intended. I mean, I certainly didn't want to be the expert on like the cheapest place to buy, you know, a shot of Jim Bean. So I said, you know what, I'm not doing that. This manuscript was accepted by my previous editor, and if you're not going to publish it, too bad, but uh, I'm not going to go and rewrite the whole thing. I think Prentice Hall doesn't exist anymore, but I'm still here. So anyway, they didn't publish it. I have the manuscript. I didn't have to give the advance back, it wasn't very much, but, um, but that was my very first book. And I didn't write another book for several, several years after. And this is the next book that I wrote. Are you curious about the title? This title is written in Morse code. And um, it's translated here on the back. It's called Hello World. A Life in Ham Radio. Now you may say to yourself, again, what the hell is he talking about? Ham radio? Isn't that like weird guys with CBs, Breaker 1-9, Rubber Ducky? Well, it's not. Um, ham radio is something that, honestly, I didn't really know anything about when I started to write this book. So you may ask yourself, how did you come to write a book about ham radio when you knew nothing about it, let alone getting it published? Well, um, this book came to be sort of an odd reason. So I wrote this book in 2002, 2002, 2003. So um, almost 20 years after the Bars of New York book. And, you know, I was working in advertising at the time and I went, I was working with a, a really great designer. His name was Paul Sayer, still is. And he is one of the sort of premier book designers, among other things he designs, but his books are really beautiful and um, award-winning and so forth. So, but I wasn't working with him on a book. I was working with him on some project for a bank. I'd hired him to design some, some ads. And one weekend, in the middle of this project, I went to the flea market in Chelsea. There used to be a big flea market on 26th Street and 6th Avenue in New York. And 
I would go there periodically just to kind of nose around and see if there's anything cool. And I found this big album, big f f kind of um, binder, and it was full of these postcards, all kinds of postcards. And the postcards were really unusual. Like some of them were handmade and some of them were of photographs of what looked like stereo equipment. And there were pictures of like really obscure desert islands. It was a very unusual collection of these cards, but they, a lot of them had these numbers on them and they, they just, they clearly seemed to be a thing, but the guy who was selling them didn't know what they were. And I said to him, how much do you want for them? And he said, 25 bucks. And I said, I'll give you 20. And he said, fine. And I walked off with this binder. And um, that evening I was going to uh, a, actually a book launch party with my friend Paul, the designer I told you about. And I sh I, he came by my house to have a beer before we headed out. And I said, look at this thing that I found at the flea market. Isn't this cool? Several hundred of these amazing postcards. And he said, those are ham radio cards. And, um, you know, they are, I'm not, he, he wasn't quite clear on what they had to do with ham radio exactly, he said, but clearly that's what they are. And so we went to this book party that evening and it was um, for a book published by Princeton Architectural Press, which is a really great publisher uh, of books, primarily visually driven books. They have nothing to do with Princeton University, my alma mater, as it happens. Um, they just were named after Princeton Architectural Press. Anyway, so um, we were speaking to an editor there that Paul knew, and Paul said, tell her about these cards you found. So I started describing them to this editor, and she said, that sounds really amazing. I bet you that could be a book. Would you like to write it? <laughs> I said, I just came here for a free drink, honestly, but... Yeah, she said, come to my office on Monday and let's have a chat about it. And, you know, I was kind of flabbergasted, um, but I talked to Paul about it and I said, well, do you want to do this with me? What if we designed this? You designed it, I wrote it, and we made this book together. And he said, yeah, that'd be cool. He'd never really published a book either, although he designed a lot of them, he'd never been the author of one. So we went and we signed a contract literally three or four days after going to this party. And that became this book. And so what this book is about, it's not really just about ham radio, although it is. Certainly a lot of it's about ham radio. Look at how gorgeous it is. You know, this is all a glossary of ham radio. And here we, I wanted to, to take, you know those old like Ladybird books or, I don't know what they're called in America, but they're like books you get like in kindergarten or second grade and they kind of explain these very basic principles to you. Well, this is, I wanted to have paintings like that. So we fired, hired an illustrator who made these paintings for us that explained at the beginning what exactly ham radio is and what these postcards are. I love that. This is an emergency. <laughs> and anyway, so it turned out that this collection of cards actually belonged to one man. His name is Jerry Powell. And Jerry was a ham. He was a ham radio operator. He was a hobbyist. Ham means you're an amateur. And so he was a ham radio operator. This is his very first card. And it is from 1928, when he was a, a young guy in, um, in Kansas. And he contacted somebody in Oklahoma. And so it turns out that these cards are ways that ham radio operators speak to each other. And so this book is all of the cards that he collected. But I went in and I found out the stories behind each one. And I did research into who was he talking to? What were they probably talking about? What was of significance that was going on? And so we went on and on, you know, just, I just, I did a lot of research. Look, this one is made of a hand carved linoleum stamp. Um, so these books are, this, and this book was kind of unusual because nobody had ever really done a book just about the nature of ham radio. Like these are pictures from the cards of just, these ham radio operators, and they were really, to me, fascinating people. A lot of them were engineers, but when the ham radio started, it was really at the, it was the, but definitely the internet of its time. When it began in the 1920s, um, it was, there was never been a thing like this before where you could speak to anybody anywhere on the planet using this equipment. And these guys who were big, they would win 
um, trophies for incredible sort of technical accomplishments with their radios. But every single ham has a card with their call numbers on it, and they send that card to whoever they speak to as a physical confirmation that they made a radio contact. And that's what these cards are. And they're so beautiful because every single one of them is unique, is designed or, or um, commissioned by the person. Look, I mean, weird things like that, husband and wife and little drawings. So it goes all the way up through um, when Jerry died, which was just before 9-11. So like very soon before, there's Jerry and his wife and son. Um, Jerry was an engineer. He was also a trombonist. So, um, you know, this book really explained it all. I love this book, and um, you know, it's just it's just odd, quirky, but it was a way of really getting to understand something. Uh, in the process, Paul and I both became licensed ham radio operators. Haven't done it in a while, but uh, if there's ever a zombie apocalypse, I'm ready. So. Hello World, my first published book. Actually published. So soon thereafter, um, when this book came out, and it was pretty cool, I mean, I was on CNN talking about it, and um, you know, and, um, what else was I on? Like, six, not 60 minutes, but ABC News or something like that. Anyway, it got quite a lot of press, because nobody had ever done a book like that. We got a full page article about it in the New York Times. It was neat. Um, so then soon thereafter, my editor at Princeton Architectural Press said, that, that was great, do you want to do another book? And I said, okay, let me think about it. And, and she said, what else are you into besides ham radio? And I said, well, I've just started to draw. And I started telling her about my illustrated journals that I'd been keeping. And she said, well, that sounds like it could be a cool book. And she said, why did you start drawing? And I was really hesitant at that point to talk about the fact that I had started drawing because it was sort of a therapeutic response to this accident that my wife had had where she had been left paraplegic after um, she was run over by a subway train. And, you know, I just felt like that wasn't really my story. It was really Patty's story. And I didn't feel like, how can I write a book about that? But the editor kept talking about it. And, and eventually, you know, we kind of came to a way of doing it a way of talking about this accident, a way of talking about this thing. And that became this book, Everyday Matters. Um, and, you know, it's the, the book is, is, is just really the diaries that I kept, illustrated journals that I kept over the, the course of um, the first couple years after her accident. And it's also about how I learned to draw and why I learned to draw. And, um, you know, of course, it's a book that's near and dear to my heart, but this came out in 2003. So basically the year after the ham radio book came out. Um, and this is the hardcover version. Then there's also a paperback version because the book was later bought by another publisher and I'll tell you about that in a second. So Everyday Matters, my second book. And then, um, meanwhile, I had a book agent and my agents, so I'd gone from being a guy at a cocktail party getting free drinks to, to a guy with two published books and a book agent in a matter of, you know, like a year and a half. And um, so my book agent took my ham radio book, which had been pretty successful, and he went to another publisher and he said, you know, um, talked a bit about me and around that time I had gone to back to that same flea market and as it happened I had come upon another booth that was selling educational film strips. I don't know if you remember educational film strips but they were something that meant a lot to me when I was a kid. They were very interesting to me and um, I bought up this a bunch of these that they had there and I started collecting these educational film strips. You may remember them they were like they were in a sort of strange little projector and they, some of them had audio and they would make a bing sound and then the teacher would turn it to the next slide or sometimes they wouldn't have any sound at all and the teacher would just kind of read it. And there would just be the series of slides really with like some words underneath. And that was sort of one of the, f you know, before people even had TVs in classrooms, there was this, these um, film strips and they kind of were around from basically the mid 1930s up until the late 70s. So they were definitely around when I was in school, not in the 1930s, I'm not that old. 
but they were definitely um, around and I remember them. And particularly when I went to school in other countries, like in Pakistan and Australia, they were kind of, I guess, a bit behind the uh, educational technology curve. So anyway, so these film strips were really interesting to me and I had a bunch of them. And so I talked to my agent about it and then he went to this other publisher and they said, great, that sounds really cool. And I did this book, it's called Change Your Underwear Twice a Week, Lessons from the Golden Age of Classroom Film Strips. It was called that because that was one of the lessons that was in one of the film strips. Um, but see, it's designed to sort of start like a film strip. And there were just so many cool images, and again, strange moments that were in these, in these um, film strips. And they covered everything you could possibly ever want to teach a kid. And there's, that's one of the projectors. And, um, you know, they covered, they covered interesting things like basically teaching kindergartners and first graders how to go to school, what, like what to do, how to behave, how to take, mat, you know, take a nap on a mat. Um, what do you do if there's a new kid and he's different and you don't really understand him? Um, this is about, I don't know, some of it's pretty funny, I have to be honest. Um, I kind of wrote it to be sort of a little silly. Um, but this is really about how to line up the entire film strip about how to stand in line, how to drink from a fountain, and uh, health and hygiene, um, lessons like don't put pencils up your nose, you know, how to eat a lunch, why must I go to sleep so early. So the thing about these, these um, here, this is a groovy one from the mid-70s about a, what happens if, you get, if you're dirty. The clean team goes onto a kid's skin surface to discover his dirtiness. Um, so this, what I did with this book is I went and I was really curious, why are they teaching kids this stuff? Why was it considered important enough to have this be part of the curriculum? There, I mean, some of these things are obvious, like there, there's things on science and, you know, um, but here's going to the dentist. Um, here's another thing about going to the dentist. It's really quite gruesome and um, pests. But then there'll be things like this, um, how to make things with paper. What does a butcher do? Or a postman? But so, I was interested in why these were things that were, um, were of interest at the time. And so I did a fair amount of studying like what was going on when the particular film strip came out and why was that considered an important thing. So for instance, um, you know, this is all about a series on, on becoming basically a, sort of an industrial worker of one kind or another, how to become a welder. Math and science, physics. Um, so I, I just love the look of a lot of these things. They were just very cool looking. Cool, so many different kinds of photography and illustrations and um, weather. And there's a series of things about, this, about space. There were lots and lots and lots of, of these film strips about space. An airbrushed one, all the way to the moon. You know, so I studied it and I found out that, you know, of course that was during the space race and America was really preoccupied with the fact that the Russians were taking over and they were winning the space race and that became really an opportunity for us to, to beat them. Um, and these are, these are things that were basically sponsored by corporations to run in schools. So this is like talking about why it's important to buy basically manufactured bread as opposed to buying, you know, baking it yourself because that's yucky and old fashioned. Or this whole series about the railroads and how important they are how crucial they are, and that's partly because they wanted the railroad lobby, wanted, you know, kids and teachers to be on their side and vote in the future. Of, you know, this whole thing about cotton from the textile information service, um, where, where rubber comes from, how to ride your bike safely, which is sponsored by Mobile, Mobile Oil. So, anyway, um, there's a picture of me, of course. Here's me with uh, two of my friends in Pakistan and my dog. One of the first places I'd ever seen an educational film strip. Yeah. So, yeah, so that book, again, seems like a slightly strange topic, but it was really 
um, a book I cared a lot about. So soon thereafter, um, I was working as chief creative officer of an ad agency, and um, you know I was in charge. I was like the number two or three person in the company, but I got fired. It was a it was a good thing. I was glad that I got fired. Honestly, it was it was the only time I've ever gotten fired in my life, but. Um, it was a horrible job and a horrible company. I was glad to be out of there. But meanwhile, they gave me a lot of severance and I had a bunch of time on my hands. So my agent said, well, what are you gonna do? And I said, well, I wanna write another book, I guess. And so, um, you know, this, that's when I came to write this book, which is called The Creative License. And I really had the idea for it kind of one afternoon. And um, I just wanted to write a book that was a response to the artist's way that was um, a really big book at the time um, on really sort of how a creative person can self-actualize. And But I wanted to do it not through writing, but through words and pictures. I wanted to explain how I thought that being an artist was something that everybody should have uh, the right to be. And so this, that's what this book is about. And it's um, it's got a lot of drawing and stuff. And it's, you know, it's it's kind of like a lot of stuff that I've done since then. I mean, it's... It's really, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good book. I mean, I, I go back and I read it from time to time and I'm sort of shocked that I wrote it because there's like actually pretty good stuff in it. But there's lots of interesting ideas and experiments and all kinds of things. Um, and but this book was really an attempt to, I think, take everything that I knew about the creative process and to sort of boil it down and to, to take sort of the story that I presented in um, Everyday Matters, which is really about my development as a, as a, into a person who draws, and to sort of make it more of a uh, more didactic, more more really like a primer that would that would be you know a, a help to people. So t anyway, so I, I explored lots of different aspects of my creativity, and also I told stories of other people that um, I had met along the way who had had sort of creative transformations too. And I really, I, you know, I think this idea of giving permission was really central to what I was trying to communicate. And I think it's been a thing throughout my life. I think it's always been something that's important to me. Um, it's sort of ironic that I had just been fired as a creative person. I don't know if that was somehow behind part of this desire to, um, to assert my my knowledge, I don't know. But anyway, this book, uh, if you prefer, you can also read it in Korean. Uh, is that Korean or the Chinese and Russian? Um, it's come out in a bunch of different languages and, and that makes me happy. Anyway, so, um, so I had spoken several times at the How Design Conference and I had written magazine articles for some of the F&W's publications. And, they asked me if I would be interested in, in doing a book for them. And I had this thought, which was to say that sketchbooks are a misunderstood phenomenon. Um, I think this is something that was a bit more of a fresh thought back in 2003 when I wrote this book. Um, but the, the, the message I was trying to give was that Sketchbooks can be an end in of themselves and that they're an important part of the creative process. And so I went and I gathered together all kinds of people, some of whom I knew, some of whom I always wanted to know. And I said, can you share with me your sketchbooks? And also, can you explain to me how you use them, what they mean to you? And so I interviewed 50 different artists for this book. Um, and, you know, this it's got some of my stuff in it, but it's really got a lot of people who I admired, like Robert Crumb and Chris Ware, Penny Dullahan, um, just lots of, lots of artists, Kathy Johnson, James, James Pachalka, some of whom I'd always wanted to meet, and this is a perfect excuse to go and do it, and to collect all their stuff together. So this is really, at the time, was a book that I couldn't find. You know, like most of the books that I've written, it was a book I couldn't find in a bookstore. Just like one place, like here's a whole bunch of great cool sketchbooks. Fortunately, there's been a bunch of books that are written like that since. Um, and here's another one that I wrote that was sort of a follow-up to An Illustrated Life, which is called An Illustrated Journey. And this just focuses on travel journals, which I think are really 
you know, in many cases, the, the, the place where people put the most effort into recording the world. And again, a bunch of amazing artists, and I got to interview them. Almost entirely different people than were in Illustrated Life, but, um, you know, an, another book that, that I think is interesting. It was originally going to be part of a tri trilogy. I was going to do a book called An Illustrated World, which is going to be about nature journals, um, but I didn't end up doing that. Actually, I was mistaken. When I said earlier I hadn't written anything between The Bar Guide and Hello World, it's not true. I had written a book that was not intended for publication at all, and it was a journal about my son when my wife was pregnant, and it was about our experience with pregnancy, my experience from my point of view, going up to when Jack was born and going through the first year of his life. And at the time, there, there just weren't really books for men about pregnancy. It was just completely a woman's domain. There were lots of books about that. But there was no, no book that really kind of prepared you for like being a dad. And for me, I felt really unprepared. I don't know, maybe most men do, but I felt really unprepared. And so I started keeping like really detailed journal, and I didn't tell my wife, actually, and I ended up giving it to her as a, a Christmas present, like, you know, when Jack was a year and a half old or so. But um, I wrote down, like, all the crazy stuff that goes on when you're pregnant, and, you know, and I, I, I thought later on, like, maybe this could be published as a book, but publishers would say to me, there's no market for books for men about pregnancy. And... Um, there's no, you know, there's no clear place to put it in the bookstore. Do we put it under maternity? Because men would never look, look there. Do we put it under memoir? They, no, they couldn't figure it out. But this is the book. And um, it's called Peanut. And it was published in a serial form in an online magazine called The Morning News. Um, but then I ended up just printing it up myself. Because to hell with it, you know, I wanted it to be a book that I could give to my son. That's really the only reason that it's in this form. Um, you can buy a copy of it, I mean, if you'd like, but uh, it's, it's a hilarious book, I gotta say. I've read it a couple times since I wrote it, and it is very funny. Um, but it's really, it's, you know, I hope that it's a book that Jack will read one day when his female companion is pregnant, or maybe his male companion, unlikely. Um, so anyway, so that is Peanut, um, and that's a book that's, Again, not really ever been published, but I wrote it and I like it. And here's another book I also wrote that was never published. It's called School for Evil, a novel for uneducated children. It has actually a blurb up here, a freaking masterpiece, seriously. It's a quote from me. Um, but there it is, there I am on the back. Um, and this is, this is like, I just wanted to write a, a, a novel for kids and it's a, it's a kind of a weird story about, it's vague, it's sort of like if you imagine that Harry Potter combined with Al-Qaeda or something like that. It was a book that was basically like this kid who looks really evil. Um, I'll show you a picture of him. He was born looking evil. He was born looking evil, but he wasn't actually evil. He was actually a nice guy. But he came from a family of evil people, and he gets sent to this school, which is like the training school for really evil people of all kinds. And he goes there, and uh, it's about his adventures there and how at first it's like, you know, he doesn't like it because he's not actually evil, but then he sort of finds things to be interested in. And, um, you know, I did a bunch of crude drawings to illustrate it. And again, this is a book that I printed as a book because I wanted it, I wanted Jack to have it. And, um, you know, nobody else is really interested in publishing it. It was, but it is, it's another funny book. It's funny. It's a funny book. School for Evil, SFE. Um, and here's yet another, this is the last of the sort of self-published trilogy that I'm going to show you, unrelated trilogy. Um, I wrote this little book, it's called Me Time. And I was just thinking about, you know, I was busy, I had a job, I had family, I had stuff to do, but I had a lot of things that I felt like it would be nice to be able to do if only I had the time. And so what I decided to do was to get up half an hour early every day, set the alarm half an hour early before anybody else got up and spend that half an hour 
on me time, doing some of the things that I wanted to do. And this little book is about setting, it's called How I Found an Extra Hour and How I Spent It. And it's a book about, you know, about doing the things that um, I did during that half an hour. So, you know, this is all about like spending time with the plants in my, on my balcony terrace and sort of really studying them and understanding them. And um, that's the last I wrote about it. And this is about going and looking at all the books that I had always been meaning to spend time with and hadn't gotten around to reading that were on my bookshelves. And so there are different books that I read. This is about spending time with my stamp collection. This is about a, um, a play that I was in in high school and I went back and studied the manuscript and kind of thought about that. And this is about going walking with my dog and just letting him go wherever he wanted to and trying to see the world through his eyes or nose and how he experienced things. This is before we got our second dog, Tim. Um, and this is our turtle, Muhammad, who was um, a strange character in our house and I decided to spend some time with him and really understand what the hell he was up to. So anyway, so I did these various things and made this little book called Me Time. And I had it printed up and it's, I don't know, it's on blurb, but it was, um, then, um, I wasn't sure if I was going to write any more books, <clears throat> and I was contacted by somebody at Chronicle Books, who's a really great publisher, and I'd always wanted to be published. And they were the perfect publisher for me in a lot of ways. You know, they publish just beautiful books, and they really understand them. And as it turned out, they ended up buying Princeton Architectural Press, my first publisher. So I, f I thought, man, I'd really love to do something with them. And they said, can you do a book that is just about you know, the basics of drawing and art making, like how do you, all the, all the different aspects of it, just a, but a simple book, like a short book, a guide to really basics of making art. And I, I wasn't sure that I felt was really qualified to do that. And I spent a bit of time thinking about it. And then in the middle of doing that, um, my wife had an accident and passed away. Um, and that completely put that book on the back burner. It was just, you know, I couldn't write a book then. And so, you know, for a year or so, I was in recovery from Patty's death. And Jack was 15 and, um, you know, we had a lot of stuff to go through. But I kept an illustrated journal throughout that time of my life. And um, I ended up, after going through that experience, feeling like this illustrated journal was telling a story that was really important to me. Um, it was also telling a story about grief that I hadn't really seen the likes of. I mean, I'd looked at a few books on grief as I went through it, just trying to understand it. Um, and, you know, there was, there just wasn't anything that completely explained the experience to me in, in a way that was truthful, but also was about the beauty that's still in life and how to sort of celebrate and commemorate your loss and the person who you lost. Um, so I ended up writing this book, it's called A Kiss Before You Go. And I went back to my publisher at Chronicle and I said, you know, I'm sorry I couldn't do that book for you, but I've written this thing, would you be interested in it? And, um, you know, they said, then they, they were, and they did a really, such a beautiful do job of this book. I mean, it's just, I think it's just my most beautiful book. And um, it's about really this year of, of what we went through, uh, Jack and I, and, and how, you know, we have Patty continue to be part of our lives and so forth. Um, if you have this book, have you ever looked at the fly leaf at the back of the dust jacket? Because if you did, you'd see these are all pictures of Patty um, and the people that she knew. Here she is with the police, um, Sting and so forth, and with Chuck Close and Howard Dean and Jean-Paul Gaultier and various other people. Um, so, anyway, this book um, is, you know, it certainly wasn't a bestseller because it's kind of a downer, honestly. But if if you are coping with grief, or you know somebody who is, and we all do in the end, as part of our lives, it's just inevitable. Um, you know, this book is designed to bring you some comfort, 
some guidance, at least by sharing an experience with somebody else who's gone through it. And it's an important book to me, of course. And uh, again, another one uh, as part of my legacy for Jack, I'm burdening him with this bookshelf full of books I wrote for him. <laughs> He'll read them one day. Little bastard. Anyway, so then after that, um, you know, I ended up moving to Los Angeles, and on the, before I moved to Los Angeles, I thought, you know, I think I can write that other book now, The Chronicle wanted me to do, but I had to do my own version of it, the book about sort of the nature of, you just kind of a practical guide to making art. Um, and so I ended up writing this book, Art Before Breakfast, which is that. It's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a book for people who are too busy to make art, teaching them how and why they should. Um, again, got a lot of drawings in it. And, you know, this book always reminds me of Los Angeles. A lot of the drawings that I did are um, from my time there. And um, this is also a book that commemorates in some way my, um, my new relationship with Jenny, who became my wife. There she is sleeping with our other dog, Tim, sleeping on the couch in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, it's also, it's just about their, their, her feet. So just about LA and about, it's, I mean, I think if you read it, you would never know that part of my life. That's not the point. It's really a book to, to encourage you to make art. And uh, we now have editions of it in Spanish, German, soon Turkish, Korean, Chinese. I think that's it for now. Maybe Russian. So um, yeah, people like this book. I like, I like it too. So then, um, I've been writing in my blog some essays about this concept of the inner critic, which I had named the monkey because I had seen this sort of little monkey creature in my head. And I ended up giving a talk at the How Design Conference, which is a big conference that I had spoken at a couple times before. Um, and it's a, it's a conference for, um, well, designers, all kinds of designers, creative people. And so I ended up um, talking to my editor there and saying, hey, how about if I turn this talk into a book, Shut Your Monkey. So, so this is Hal Books, which was the publisher of Illustrated Life, Illustrated Journey. So they knew me and they said, great, let's do this book. And I said, I wanted to make it, I wanted to make it simple and inexpensive. And so it's all, the book is designed to be all black and white. And it is all black and white um, with these kind of little strange drawings in it. Um, you know, it has a lot of monkeys in it, a lot of kind of weird lettering and photographs. Um, so it's, it's kind of a different looking book, but it still has my my point of view in it. Um, I love that picture. So that's a nice little book, Shut Your Monkey. And um, then the last book that I've written so far is, is this, Art Before Breakfast, the workbook. Because when um, Art Before Breakfast is doing well, and my publisher said to me, would you make a workbook that people could actually physically work in, that they could draw inside of, that they could take some of the lessons from um, Art Before Breakfast, and you could just kind of hold their hand and walk them through step by step how to do it. And that's really what this book is. So it's a book that you're meant to con collaborate with me on, where you would do the stuff that I talk about, and then you would do your version of it here. And, uh, you know, so, um, so I designed this book. I did not design Shut Your Monkey. Um, I did not design Illustrated Life, Illustrated Journey, Change Your Underwear, or Life in Ham Radio, Hello World, but I did design my other books. Um, and I'm not a designer, but after you've designed half a dozen books, maybe you are. I don't know. So those are the books that I've written so far. I'm not sure if or when I'll write another one, but, um, and I hope that this hasn't been too long and discursive, but that's this week's Sketchbook Club. Um, Next week, we will go back to uh, looking at the sketchbooks of other people. <laughs> and um, thanks for indulging me today. Um, I, I enjoy Sketchbook Club. I enjoy sharing with you the books that um, are in my collection. And uh, those books include the books I've written. So thanks for, for sharing them with me today. And I'll see you next time.